If you uh, have Bibles with you, open them up to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 8 through 17 this morning. Romans 1, 8 through 17. And before I go any further, I want you to repeat a saying after me. As a follower of Christ, I am obligated. If you'll remember that line, you'll be able to take home exactly what I intend for this message to grab a hold of you today. As followers of Christ, we have an obligation. Truth is, obligations have always been a part of our life, right? As a child, we were obligated to listen to our parents. Some of you who are still teenagers and children, you're still obligated to listen to your parents. Parents, feel free to nudge an elbow right now so that they grab a hold of that idea. As a kid, you have an obligation to do your schoolwork. As an athlete, I had an obligation to listen to my coaches. As an employee, I had an obligation to listen to my bosses. As a husband, I have an obligation to love my wife as Christ loved the church. As a father and a grandfather, which it seems kind of crazy that I can call myself a grandfather. As a father and a grandfather, I have the obligation to love and lead my children and grandchildren to the throne of Christ. You see, the fact is, is that we have obligations. As a fan of the Ohio State Buckeyes, I have an obligation to hate that team up north. So, 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 (laughs) there's no booing and hissing the preacher at church, so. Uh, So, as a follower of Christ, what obligations do we have? Do we understand that God has given us grace for a purpose? And that purpose is not so that we can sit back and just wait for heaven to come. And so often, I think when we live the Christian life, that's what we're doing. We accept Jesus Christ to be our Savior, we, to be our Savior, and then after that, we just sit back and we wait for heaven to come. What about our obligations that we have today? What about the obligations that we have toward the church? What about the obligations that we have toward the people who are seated around us right now? Because believe it or not, their faith is part of your responsibility. What about the obligations? obligations that we have, right, that we have to people who have not even stepped foot inside of church? Do we have a role to play in their lives? Has God left the church here for the purpose of reaching them? See, we're obligated. So as a follower of Christ, I am obligated. We are are obligated. We started a series of sermons last week through the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And just for a quick review, from the time that Paul gave his life to Jesus Christ, he felt this sense of obligation. As a matter of fact, from the time that he gave his life to Jesus Christ, he was completely and forever changed. He became this radical follower of Christ that spent the rest of his life taking this gospel message to as many people as possible. He introduced himself as a slave for Christ, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, and that he was set apart for the sake of the gospel. And the, and the point that I wanted us to grab a hold of last week was this. Obedience follows our faith. Paul said that, that when we're faithful, we'll be obedient. And, and that he came to share that gospel message and call people to an obedience that comes from faith. And so as we piggyback off of that, I want us to just remember, I'm going to say it again. As a follower of Christ, I am obligated. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you. We praise you for this opportunity that we have today to worship you through the singing of your, uh, singing of your praises, through song, through the giving of our offerings, Lord, and through the time that we have in your word. May it glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's dream for a moment. You've been given a special call today from Donald Trump himself. And Donald Trump has invited you. Now, regardless of if you like him or not, don't even, don't go there, just a little. He's giving you this special call. He says, I want you, I'm going to give you the opportunity to come to Washington, D.C., and we're going to call a joint session of Congress. And so we're going to have everybody that that calls himself a leader of our country, we're going to have them there. I'll be there. The Supreme Court will be there. And then here's here's what else we're going to do. We're going to call every member of the media there. Everyone in the world is going to listen to what you have to say. And so I want to ask you this question. At that point, what is your message? What do you want to declare at that moment? See, many of us will go there and and, and we'll want to stand up for the rights of the unborn. Many of us will go there and we'll want to stand up for the rights of law-abiding citizens to carry firearms. Many of us will go there and we'll want to make sure religious freedoms are protected. We'll want to point out the problem of homelessness in our world. We'll We'll want to talk about climate change, whether you're for it or against it. 
Right. We want to talk about all of the things that just we see life happening, and yet, 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 as Christians, we leave out the most important thing. We do. We leave it out. You know how I know we would do it? All we have to do is take a look at our social media pages. The things that we argue for and, 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 and shout over, the things that we're most passionate about, those are the things that we'll declare. And so you get this opportunity. You're standing up there before all the world to see, and you say, this is what's most important to me. What would Paul do? Let's look at verses 8 through 15. Paul says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but have thus far been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So Paul shares with us his obligation there. He felt this sense of an obligation, this ought to. Really, there are three things that he senses himself to be obligated to. The first one is this. Paul felt the obligation to pray for those who were in Rome. He felt the obligation to pray for those who were in Rome. So a quick question that we have to answer that I have not yet attempted to answer in this series of sermons is this. How did the church get to Rome? Uh, that's one of the things. Our Roman Catholic friends want us to believe that Peter, uh, that he visited Rome and he established the church there in Rome, became the first pope. But the fact is there's no biblical evidence that Peter ever stepped foot in the city of Rome until he was killed there. So uh, one can make an argument that the letter of Paul was, uh, that he wrote to the church was proof that the church was not started by Peter at all because Paul tells us in Romans 15, 20 that he wouldn't want to establish a work based upon the work of somebody else. And, and so some believe that the church in Rome happened organically, meaning this, it was the capital city of the known world at that time. So Christians would naturally migrate to the city and as they would migrate there, as Christians, what should we do when we migrate? We should take the gospel with us, and that's what took place. Most likely, there were, the, the, the church was there because there were believing Jews in, at uh, Jerusalem on the Pente day of Pentecost when Peter preached. As a matter of fact, if you flip back there to Acts chapter 2, Rome is listed as one of the cities that was there. So, that was there. And, and Paul tells us that your faith, your faith is being reported all over the world. What was it about their faith that was being reported? Was it the persecution they were enduring? Was it the church rapidly growing? Was it the fact that the gospel message had penetrated the, the, the capital city of the empire? I think that's, that's what it was. You know, we like to celebrate as Christians anytime a celebrity or anytime a politician pulls out a verse and uses it out of context. So I, th I think here that Paul, what Paul is saying here is, listen, the gospel has penetrated Rome. This is worthy of celebrating. And co Paul calls upon God as his witness as his witness, that every time he thinks of them, he's praying for them. He's praying for them. And, and so that leads me to ask this question for us. Do we, do we have this sense of obligation that we're praying for each other? You see, Paul, Paul, I think he could have been praying a number of things for the church in Rome. He could have been praying that they would be able to endure persecution. He could have been praying that God would create in them this hunger to know more and more of Jesus Christ. He could have been praying that God would place a supernatural love for one another among them to help them understand what they've been called to do, to be emboldened to preach the gospel. And so Paul starts off, after he gets through this general introduction, he starts off and he says, listen, I thank God. First, I want you to know, I thank God for you. For you. Church, I want to ask you to do something right now. I want you to look around the room as much as you can. I know some people have stiff necks and it's hard to turn. I want you to look around the room. Every person that you just looked at, you have an obligation to pray for. Every one of them. 
You see, and I wonder, I wonder at times if we don't let that obligation go right by us. First, we have an obligation to pray for our leaders. And listen, this is a little dangerous. <laughs> I like to get in trouble sometimes from the pulpit. This is, but, but do you pray for your leaders? I mean, really, really pray for them, for the pastors, for the deacons, for the worship leaders, for the youth pastors, uh, for the children's ministry workers. Do you pray for them? Because here's what I see as a leader, and I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about in the church. Here's what I see. People don't often pray for their leaders. They, they criticize their leaders. Te- they, they tear their leaders apart. Leaders make a decision they don't like, and they're just, they, they rake them over the coals. The fact is, is that leaders are easy targets. Why? Because we can't fight back. We fight back. Here's what happens. You leave. We, and if you don't leave, what you do is you call a meeting and have, have the pastor removed, the youth pastor removed, the worship leader removed. Make sure you, you, you do things to get the person who's volunteering out. And pretty soon, all the people that were doing stuff are gone. Listen, I'm not saying that's happening here. I really am just trying to prove a point. Are we praying for our leaders? I mean, really praying for them. Paul knew that prayer was important. He believed in the power of prayer, and he asked for the church in Philippi to pray for his deliverance. Philippi, or Philippians 1.19. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Paul believed that when you prayed for somebody in ministry, you joined them in ministry. Romans 15, 30, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Paul asked for prayer to, be, uh, to, to have a bold proclamation of the gospel. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, and also pray for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Colossians 4, verses 2 through 4, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, and that it may make it clear which is I ought to speak. See, I could keep sharing verse after verse, but the fact of the matter is this. Have you prayed for your leaders? Hey, Not only do you have the responsibility to pray for everybody around you, you have the responsibility for those whom God has called to lead you to pray for them. Can you say to them when you when you walk up to them, like when you're just going up, hey, listen, I prayed for you this week. I I pray that you would be faithful. I pray that you would share God's word. I pray that you would stand up under, under the trials that are there. Have you done that? And before you take a complaint, I want you to ask these questions. Have I prayed that God is strengthening them in their walk? Have I prayed that they are hearing from God in his word? Have I prayed that their families are encouraged and walking with Christ? Have I prayed that the Holy Spirit is guiding their thoughts? And listen, listen, when you've done that, if you can go, if you come up to me and say, listen, pastor, I got a concern. But before I share this concern, I'm praying for you. This is what I desire for you. This, man, you say that to me, and I'm all ears because I know the Holy Spirit's working through you. Have you prayed for your leaders? See, not only do we have the responsibility to pray for our leaders, we have the obligation to pray for one another. Every person that you've looked at. One of the reasons that we've stopped praying for one another, if I can just be honest, we've stopped congregating with one another. Church has become optional to us. And just apart from church, you know, it's easy to sit in rows. It's easy to sit in rows and have one guy stand up in front and talk. It's a lot harder to sit in circles. You know what happens in rows? Information is is transferred. You know what happens in circles? Transformation takes place when you begin to do life with each other and begin to pray for one another. When you sit in circles, when you go beyond just sitting in a row and you decide that you're going to attach yourself to a group of people, rather that be being on the worship team, these guys are or a grow group together, rather that be being on a mission team together, rather that be joining a small group in somebody's home, this is what happens. For many of us in the United States, church has become a lot like going to the movies. We walk in, we find our seats, we keep to ourselves, there's very little interaction with the people around us. One of the goals that we have as a church is that you put yourself in a grow group. Because in a grow group, we believe that, that good stuff will happen to you. I get the opportunity as the pastor to sit with people all the time. And I'm learning to ask this question when they talk about a struggle. All right, what group are you a part of? Who are you sharing this with? Who's praying for you? 
See, that, that's what we have to do. We have to put ourselves in those positions to grow. James wrote these words. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So we just got to put ourselves in those positions to grow. Second lesson we get from this. Paul felt the obligation to encourage, to encourage and equip. Look again at verses 10 through 12. He says, I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Uh, sound a little bit like a broken record here for a moment. This doesn't happen in rows. It doesn't. Yeah, very rarely can we just be encouraged by sitting and listening to the truth being proclaimed from one person. But when we share the truth together as a group, when we use the gifts that God has given us to, to encourage and to equip each other in groups, what we're doing is we're putting ourselves in a position to see God work in mighty ways. So we have to ask this question. Am I willing to get out of my comfort zone and get into a group to see how God is going to work through that group to encourage and equip me? That's what Paul wanted to do. He wanted to go to the church in Rome to visit them so that he could encourage and equip. And see, God has given us, if you want to flip your Bibles over to Romans 12, if you have them there, God has given every single one of us a gift to use. This is what he says. We'll unpack this at a greater level later. But he says, for by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of it. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And then he goes on to say, whatever that gift is, use it. So I just want to ask you a question. Has God gifted you with something? And the answer is yes. It's yes. It's every single one of us have a gift to use. Now the next follow-up question, are you using it? Do you have this sense of obligation to use it? And once again, as you think about all the people that you looked at, when I asked you to look around the room, you have a responsibility toward them. God has caused you to be a hand or a foot or a mouth or something in the body of Christ so that you could speak up, so that you could serve, so that you could go. Are you willing to use it? That's an obligation that we have. The final obligation that Paul felt was to preach the gospel. Verses 13 through 15. That's where he says there, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. One of the best opening lines of a book that I've ever read. Well, of course, in the beginning, God. That's the best one. <laughs> yeah. Next one is, uh, it's not about you. Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. The third one, if I were to list the best opening lines of a book that I've ever read, is by a man named Robbie Gallaty, and he wrote it in Growing Up, and this is what he said. The gospel came to you on the way to someone else. The gospel came to you on the way to someone else. Paul is a man who not only understood this in his head, but he lived it out with his life. And so what's the harvest that he wanted to grab a hold of? You know, it was the spiritual growth of the believers that were in the church of Rome, but it was also the proclamation of the gospel to people who had not yet become a part of that church so that they would respond to that. And what do you think Paul meant by that obligation? And here's what I think. Man. We spend so much time trying to define words, and it just, I want us to feel it for a moment on a heart level. I want us to try to jump inside Paul's head and heart and grab a hold of what he was feeling at that moment. You see, because he was on that road to Damascus to tear apart the church. And on that road, he met Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ not only forgave him, but he filled him. And from that time on, Paul thought, listen, I, this has been given to me. I've got to take it to as many people as possible. 
I've got to give this to every person that I run into. And I wonder, I look at us as a church today, and I wonder if we have that sense of this obligation, that without the message that God has put in our mouths, that he's put in our hearts, without declaring that to the rest of the world, that if they were to die today, that they would spend an eternity in hell. I wonder if that bothers us at times. I wonder if we feel this sense of obligation to carry this out to other folks. That's what Paul felt So he had this relationship with Jesus Christ and he was going to do whatever he had to do to take it to other people. He says to Greeks and to barbarians. Really saying to those who speak Greek and those who don't. I remember in the seventh grade geography class that I took in Ohio, one of the only things I ever remember about middle school was uh, in this geography class, the teacher put up a map on an overhead transparency. Kids, ask your parents what those are. They'll explain it to you. Uh, so they put that up on a map. Uh, so if that, and uh, it had the map, to, it had it divided this way. It had it divided between civilized societies and savages. And it doesn't take too much to re- think that they had Africa all listed as savages, and it's easier to enslave savages than it is civilized people. Paul says, I want to take the gospel to everyone. You, know, you Greeks, you don't want to talk to non-Greek speaking people? I want to preach to them. Paul says to the wise and the foolish, those who understand and even those who may have a difficult time in grasping the gospel, that's who I want to take it to. Fact is, is I I think we've messed it up today in our world. I do. I I think we have have called the trained instead of training the called. I think we have looked for man's stamp of approval on people that God has called to preach, and we've waited for that stamp of approval, and and thus what we have done is we've created churches and systems and everything else, and the church in the United States flourished the most when one person felt called to preach, and the church said, all right, go, preach. Open up the, go go home today and open up your internet browser and look for ministry jobs. Most churches looking for a pastor want them to have at least a master's degree. I don't see it. See, the only thing I see is that God wanting somebody who's sold out and willing to take the gospel message to everyone, the wise and the foolish. For Paul, there wasn't anyone he was willing to leave out. If you're breathing, (laughs) I thought of this, if you're breathing, he'd preach to you. If you're dead, he'd preach the gospel to those who were standing around you. And if you were around and died while he was preaching the gospel, he would walk out, raise you from the dead, and continue to preach the gospel to you. And that's how sold out this guy was to that message. And I wonder, when we look around us, do we have this sense of an obligation? Does, do we have, I mean, how would it be worded to us today? Would, do we want to preach the gospel to the Christian and the Muslim? Do we want to preach the gospel to the heterosexual and the homosexual? Do we want to preach the gospel to the capitalist and the socialist? Do we want to preach the gospel to the Republican and the Democrat? Do we want to preach the gospel to the pro-lifer and the pro-choicer? See, that's the question that we have to ask. And I love what Paul says. I love it. I just, I mean, I got goosebumps thinking about this. He said, I'm eager to do this. Have you ever, like, just been bursting at the seams to tell somebody something? Paul met Jesus Christ in that eagerness, just welling up in him. Listen, I'm eager. I can't wait. I was like, coming out. I'm, re- I'm ready, huh? Can, can we talk? Okay, let's talk about the gospel. Let me tell you about this. I'm, I got a really important thing to tell you. It's Jesus Christ loves you. He died for you. He rose again. Do you want to put your faith in that? Everything he would have done would have been toward that goal. What are we eager about? Well, look at our social media feeds. Listen to what we talk about at our family gatherings. Truth is, if you listen to many of us as Christians, we've put more faith in the Republican Party than we have the Word of God truth is, when you listen to us as Christians, we put more faith in our guns than we have the Holy Spirit to protect us. Listen, I'm for both of those things. Do we believe in the power of the gospel? Paul said it this way, for I, (laughs) I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Do we believe it? Do we really believe it? If we do, man, we'll have this eagerness to proclaim it. We'll have this one-track mind that everybody we talk to, every conversation we had, will always lead to this point. Hey, can I talk to you about what really matters? It's the gospel. 
Jesus loves you. He died for you. When you put your faith in him, he seals you with his righteousness. He gives it to you. Can we talk about that? He was in every conversation to do just that thing. Jesus spoke these words in Matthew. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny and not one of them will fall to the ground from your father? But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are, more, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men... I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven, but whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. So what are we afraid of? Rejection? Are we afraid of death? I mean, what's the worst that can happen? We close our eyes, we open them up in front of our Savior. Are we eager to do this? If we believe it, that's what we'll preach. So, Paul believed in the power of the gospel because it was a uh, power to save everyone who believes. Therefore, Paul was eager to preach this gospel message. And because Paul, Paul believed in the preaching of the gospel that would bring a harvest in those outside the church and inside the church, Paul thought it was his role to go into the church to equip and encourage the church. And Paul believed in the power of prayer to pray for the church because, why? Because he believed in the power of the gospel. Do we have that sense of obligation? Do we believe in the power of the gospel? Do we believe in this simple message for the wise and the foolish? If we do, we'll be eager to run out of this room and proclaim it. So as a follower of Christ, I am obligated. Are you? Let me pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you for the great gifts of grace that you give us in life. We praise you that, that through this simple message of Jesus living and dying for our sins, resurrecting from a grave, that when we place our faith, our trust in that, you give us the hope of heaven. That's the power. That's the power of salvation for everyone who believes, God, that you'll give us your righteousness in exchange for our sin. It's that simple. And I pray, Lord, as we think about just every soul in this room, if it, that decision has not yet been made, that it's made today. That trust is placed in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of your spirit to be firmly planted within them. Father, I also pray for us as a body of believers that we truly believe in the power of the gospel. Not only the power of the gospel for our get out of hell free card, but the power of the gospel for the proclamation that you've set us about to do, to proclaim it, to live it, to declare it every opportunity we have, to believe, Lord, that that's the only hope of the world. The hope of the world is not found anywhere else other than the gospel of Christ. So help us, Lord, as we run out of this room to run into the world with this message, this message of hope, this message that can save. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand